think it's one of my favorite Sanctity of Human Life Sunday illustrations. It's by Pastor Max Lucado in his book, The Applause of Heaven. And Max writes about a sweater that hangs in his closet. He says he doesn't wear it because it's too small. The sleeves are too short, the shoulders too tight, some of the buttons are missing, and the thread is frazzled. Logically, he really should throw it in the garbage. After all, it's taking up space in his closet, he has no use for it, and he'll more than likely never wear it again. That's what logic says. But love won't allow him to do it. Why not? What's unusual about that sweater? Well, to start with, it has no label. No tag telling you, wash in cold water. That's because it wasn't made in a factory. It wasn't produced on an assembly line as a product of a nameless employee learning a living. No, it was created by a devoted mother expressing her love. His mother. And because of that, the sweater is unique, one of a kind, irreplaceable. Each strand was chosen with care, each thread selected with affection, and so even though that sweater has lost all of its use, it's lost none of its value. It's valuable not because of function, but because of its maker. And that's the way it is with each human life. And so Max concludes with these words. He says, in similar fashion, God carefully knit our lives together when we were hidden in the secret place. He has a purpose for each of us, and we are of infinite value to him. So here's my question. How do you suppose God feels when we take his most prized creation and then casually dump it in the trash? Maybe John Donne said it best when he said, the greatest gift of God, I would think, is the gift of life. The greatest sin of humans, it would seem, would be to return that gift ungratefully and unopened. June 24th, 2022 was a historic day in our nation. Our Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade effectively ending recognition of a constitutional right to abortion and giving individual states with power to allow, to allow, limit, or ban the practice altogether. So after praying and marching and sidewalk counseling and picketing and debating and lobbying for almost 50 years, why in the world should the church not celebrate? Why in the world would we, as God's people, not rejoice at the overturning of a despicable law that led to the slaughter of over 60 million children? Just kind of seems like a no-brainer to me. Our sermon series is called The Real Jesus, Raw and Unfiltered. And my focus over these weeks is to compare some of the most popular narratives that we're hearing out there in our culture, to compare those narratives with what Jesus actually said. You see, I'm concerned, and I'm also convinced, that there's a whole lot of people out there speaking up for Jesus, insisting they know what he'd say, that really are basically clueless. And since we're observing Sanctity of Human Life Sunday today, we'll consider one of the popular narratives surrounding that subject, this whole idea that Jesus really didn't care about abortion, so why in the world should we? MSNBC host Joe Scarborough excoriated Christians who oppose abortion. Here's just a short snippet of his tirade. He said, let me just say, as a Southern Baptist that grew up reading the Bible, maybe a backslidden Baptist, but I still know the Bible, and Jesus never once talked about abortion. Never once. And it was happening back in ancient times. It was happening back in his time. Never once mentioned it. And for people perverting the gospel of Jesus Christ, and for people perverting the gospel of Jesus Christ down to one issue, that's heresy. If you believe me, 
If, if, that, if, that, if you don't believe me, if that makes you angry, why don't you do something you haven't done in a long time? Open the Bible. Open the New Testament. Read the red letters. You won't see it there. Well, Joe is right about one thing. He's obviously a backslidden Baptist, isn't he? <laughs> Technically, Joe is right. Based on the biblical record, Jesus never did use the word abortion. And in fact, the word abortion is not in the Bible. But if that's the standard we're using, then we should also consider that Jesus never used the word slavery or sex trafficking or spousal abuse, or child abuse, or drug use, or sexual assault, or infanticide, or pedophilia, or bestiality. Jesus never used any of those words either. And yet I'm pretty sure he probably had an opinion on those subjects. So what's our response today? What are we going to say to Joe? I'm going to give you three realities. If you happen to pick up an outline, um, you can certainly fill in some of the blanks. I'm going to fire off a lot of different references, not one text that we're going to move through today like we usually would do, but I will be throwing out a lot of different Bible passages and verses, and so if you want to have a pen or pencil handy, then certainly encourage you. You can write some of these down, and that way come back to them later. I really would like to begin with taking a look at what's going on in the world around us, as tough as it is. And this will probably be the most uncomfortable point in the message today, but it's one that we need to to talk about. Let's deal with the moral bankruptcy that's currently taking place in our culture. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but when it comes to immoral immoral practices, our secular culture will often follow this pattern. First, they demand tolerance. You need, you need to tolerate our right to do this. And then they demand acceptance. Now, beyond that, not just tolerate, you have to accept and approve of this practice. And eventually, they demand celebration, rejoicing with them in that, and then finally, participate with us. If you, if you just kind of watch and observe in culture, you'll see that pattern played out over and over again. And that has certainly been the case with the abortion debate. When the Supreme Court initially handed down its Roe versus Wade decision, the rhetoric was all about tolerance. I don't know if you can remember back in those days, but early on the argument was, we really don't know what the fetus is. We can't tell if it's a blob of tissue or, or a clump of cells. And then you heard this phrase being tossed about quite frequently, safe, legal, and rare, right? Safe, legal, and rare. In fact, that became, the common, became very common during the 1992 campaign when Bill, Bill Clinton frequently used it. Uh, Clinton told the Congressional Women's Caucus that year, he said, we have to remind the American people once again that being pro-choice is very different from being pro-abortion. But those days are long gone. Now we must accept the reality of abortion. And so now the rhetoric rhetoric is more along the lines of, yeah, we know it's a baby, but so what? Joe Scarborough just lectured us, we don't have the right to be angry, according to him. We we don't have the right to be angry about the slaughter of children. But it didn't stop there, did it? No, the the pro-death camp isn't happy until we participate and even celebrate abortion. And so if you're watching what's going on, there's a movement afoot now, so to shout your abortion, let everybody know, be proud of this. Put on a t-shirt that reads, everyone knows I had an abortion, and even thank God for abortion. I think one of the clearest pictures of that celebration was a few years ago when the New York State Legislature voted to allow it right up until the moment of birth. And if you remember, when that bill passed, the legislators actually stood to their feet and applauded. Celebration. Right up to the moment of birth, and we're going to stand and applaud, celebrate. 
Then New York Governor Andrew Cuomo followed that up by ordering that the One World Trade Center spire be lit pink, lit up in pink to celebrate the signing of this extreme bill. Just how broken are we as a society? Well, with the overturning of Roe, the pro-death camp has come unhinged. Just within the last couple of months, National Public, Public Radio aired an audio recording, audio recording of a woman aborting her twins. I mean, just try to imagine wanting to listen to not one, but two human beings being destroyed by dismemberment. And then there's this. Uh, last fall, the, the people of Montana voted to terminate babies born alive after surviving failed abortions. And it forces us to ask, you know, what kind of, what kind of people have we become? What kind of country do we live in? You know, there must be some monster inside us that our desire for women's rights is so great that we won't even assist a child that is struggling for its life on an operating table. Here's where I'm going with all this. To argue that Jesus would condone these types of behavior, behaviors is, is absolutely ludicrous. It, would, it defies all logic. And yet here we are. I mean, we're living in the day that the Apostle Paul described at the end of Romans 1, Right? And if you're familiar with that text, you just know the digression away, the rebellion from, from God, until ultimately, here's, the, here's like the pinnacle, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they approve of those who practice them. They celebrate those who are, are drawn into that sin with them. It's a moral bankruptcy of our culture. Reality number two is the biblical response to Joe's accusation. So how do we answer? How, how do we respond? What, what, what do we come back to if, if Jesus never mentioned abortion? Well, initially, let me state the obvious. Arguments from silence are always weak. And so there's a big difference between the record being silent about Jesus' opinion on something and Jesus being silent about it. The fact is, we don't have everything that Jesus said and did. We don't have a record of everything that Jesus said and did. The Apostle John makes that clear. You can see it there on the screen. He says there are many things that Jesus said, there are many things that Jesus did that, that weren't recorded, that weren't written down. But beyond that, no serious student of the Bible can deny that Jesus didn't completely and unequivocally endorse the truthfulness and accuracy of what he would have called the scriptures. We know it today as the Old Testament, but he would have called it the scriptures. And so, even if you're not a believer, it's impossible to ignore the fact that Jesus held the scriptures in the highest possible esteem. When dealing with the people of his day, whether it was with the disciples or religious rulers, he constantly referred to the Old Testament. Jesus would use language like this. He says, have you not read what God said to you? Talk about the Old Testament. This is what God said to you. Have you not read that? It was Jesus who insisted in his most famous sermon that the word of God is indestructible. He said, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Jesus also affirmed that what the Old Testament authors recorded was divinely inspired. And so in Mark 12, he said, David himself speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared. This is the testimony of Jesus, and he's saying what David wrote were actually, the words that David wrote were actually the result of the Holy Spirit's leading in his life. You can't say it any clearer than John 10, 35, where Jesus flat out stated, the scriptures cannot be broken. All of which caused Bible scholar John Wenham to put it this way. He said, to Christ, the Old Testament was true, authoritative, inspired. To him, the God of the Old Testament was the living God, and the teaching of the Old Testament was the teaching of the living God. To him, what Scripture said, God said. Now, if you're paying real close attention, implicit in Joe Scarborough's tirade was the presumption that Jesus' words, or lack thereof, are more authoritative than the rest of Scripture. 
Remember he said, open the New Testament and read the red letters? Remember that statement? Read the red letters? But that's not how Jesus looked at the Scriptures. As far as he was concerned, all Scripture was God's, God's Word, not just the red letters. So what exactly? Let's, 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 let's go there. Let's, let's do what Joe asked us to do. Let's open our Bibles and read them and, and see what the Word of God has to say about the sanctity of human life. Where you want to start? How about Genesis chapter 1? Every human being is made in the image of God. And because of that, each human being has infinite value. We're told there, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Not only that, but based on the authority of the scriptures, every human life is uniquely formed in the womb with a purpose in mind. Classic text here. Many of you would be familiar with it. Psalm 139 where the psalmist says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. God was involved. Even, in, even during the, the time that we were in our mother's womb, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Then you would have other passages like Jeremiah 1.5 that clearly tell us that God has a relationship with the developing fetus. He tells the prophet, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Other passages teach that life and death decisions are not ours to make. They belong to our sovereign creator. Deuteronomy 32, see now that I myself am he. There is no God besides me. I'm the one who put to death, and I'm the one who brings to life. Yes, it's true. Jesus never used the word abortion, but he did talk about murder. And everything Jesus said about murder applies to abortion, which is a type of murder. Scarborough argues that Jesus never once talked about abortion, even though it was happening in ancient times. While abortions did occur in the first century, they weren't permitted under Jewish law any more than any other type of murder. And so in one sense, there was no reason for Jesus to spe specifically address that issue because it was already forbidden by the law. Furthermore, Jesus' audience, the, the, the crowd that he spent, spent most of his time talking to were Jews. Jews who, who, who treated their children, including unborn children, as a blessing, as a reward, as a fulfillment of God's promise. And that comes through there in Psalm 127. In other words, explicitly condemning abortion to the Jews was, was not necessary. It was, an, it was a non-issue. The list of examples goes on, and the evidence is clear. Jesus viewed the Old Testament as being God's word, and his attitude towards it was nothing less than total trust. Many people want to accept Jesus, and, the, and yet they, they reject a portion of the Old Testament. It, 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 is, it doesn't work. Either Jesus knew what he was talking about, or he didn't. And if a person believes in Christ, he should be consistent and believe that the Old Testament and its accounts are accurate. We've talked about the moral bankruptcy of our culture. We've given the biblical response uh, to, to the accusation. Let me just finish up today by talking about our obligation to faithfully engage. A lot of different passages I could go to here. I chose Proverbs 24 because it makes it very clear that we don't have a choice. We don't have a choice as, a, as followers of Jesus. We need to take a stand for life, especially for the most vulnerable among us. Isn't that what it says? Look, look at it. Read with me. Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. And if you, would, if you try to say, well, we knew nothing about this. Does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay each person according to what he has done? Uh, I belong to a, a group of friends and we, we call ourselves Table 43. 
It's a group of guys who meet regularly at pizza for lunch, typically about once a month. Solid camaraderie, stimulating conversation. And I apologize, Joe, I couldn't find a picture with you in it. You missed the Christmas banquet. I want you to see Adam there in the middle of the picture. Adam has Down syndrome. Adam used to work at Pizza Hut. He's since retired. But whenever we meet for lunch, Adam is always there. I can't take any credit for that. It's the other guys around that table who make it happen. They invite him, let him know when, where we're meeting. In fact, a couple of them go the extra mile. They'll spend extra time with Adam. They take him bowling, take him out to dinner, buy him things when they know that he needs something. We all enjoy having Adam as part of our group. Why did I bring that up? Because Jesus loves Adam. Jesus desires Adam to be protected. All human life has value in God's sight. Do you know that Iceland is actually close to completely eradicating Down syndrome births? It's not a good thing. As the show CBSN, our assignment reporter recently, the eradication has nothing to do with medical breakthroughs that cure the condition that arises from having an extra chromosome. It has everything to do with parents deciding to abort fetuses that test show may have the condition. Women in Iceland aren't required to take the test, but medical professionals are required to tell them about its availability. And 80 to 85 percent of them agree to be screened. Some admit to feeling pressure. Virtually all who test positive end their pregnancies. Don't make the mistake of assuming that this trend is confined to Iceland. Much of Europe is on the same path. And CBS cited stats showing 67% of women whose unborn children test positive for Down syndrome Down syndrome in the U.S. also choose to abort. In 2017, Frank Stevens, an advocate for Global Down Syndrome Foundation, delivered a powerful speech to the Massachusetts House Appropriations Subcommittee. It was a speech in which he said this. He said, I don't feel like I should have to justify my existence. But to those who question the value of people with Down syndrome, first, We're a medical gift to society, a blueprint for medical research into cancer, Alzheimer's, and immune system system disorders. Secondly, we are an unusually powerful source of happiness. A Harvard-based study has discovered that people with Down syndrome as well as their parents and siblings are happier than society at large. And then Frank closed with this request. He said, see me as a human being, not a birth defect, not a syndrome. I don't need to be eradicated. I don't need to be cured. I need to be loved, valued, educated, and sometimes helped. I found it interesting that the speaker at this year's Northeast Indiana March for Life is Katie Shaw. She's a Hoosier pro-life advocate. Katie has Down syndrome. And she serves on the board of Down Syndrome Indiana, has lobbied at the State House for pro-life legislation. Last year, she had the opportunity to address the National March for Life where her inspiring speech reached hundreds of thousands. Again, I'm going to invite you to join me next Saturday at noon to hear what she has to say. Proverbs 24, 
challenges us, rescue those who are being led away to death, hold back those who are staggering towards slaughter. But understand this, recognize the fact that standing up for life is getting riskier all the time. Ever since, May 2nd, ever since that May 2nd leak, that Roe was about to be overturned, there's been an escalation of violence against the pro-life community. Family Research Council published a report entitled Hostility Against Churches is on the Rise in the U.S. Part of that, uh, part of that report read like this, churches saw a spike in graffiti incidents with pro-abortion messages and protests that interrupted church services. This trend has continued since the Dobbs decision was officially handed down and Roe versus Wade was overturned. At least 57 incidents from January 22nd January 2022 to September 2022 were directly tied to pro-abortion protests or contained pro-abortion messages. By contrast, only five incidents between 2019 and 2021 were abortion-related. So you can see the trend. You can see the direction it's moving. There's another article in Fox News. It said, not a single arrest has been made in more than a dozen attacks on pro-life organizations across this country that are actually claimed by left-wing pro-abortion group Jane's Revenge. Jane's Revenge has claimed responsibility for at least 18 arson and vandalism attacks on crisis pregnancy centers and other faith-based organizations throughout the U.S. All these attacks and, and not a single arrest Instead, Associated Attorney General Vanita Gupta admitted earlier this month that the Justice Department has targeted pro-life activists in the wake of the Supreme Court decision. In remarks delivered at the Justice Department's 65th anniversary on December 6, Gupta said that the Supreme Court's decision dealt a devastating blow to women throughout this country. In fact, the Justice, Justice Department has actually ramped up prosecutions of pro-life activists in the months following that Supreme Court decision. Under a law that was barely used in 2020, 2021, it's now been used to indict 26 people in 2022. Here's what it comes down to, gang. Pro-lifers are now the far-right extremists. We are, we're labeled the radicals. And I could give you many examples, but I'll just mention a couple quick ones here. During a recent episode of MSNBC's Cross Connection, Amy Hagstrom Miller, president of Whole Women's Health, told host Tiffany Cross that Christian extremism is motivating the pro-life movement. What's behind the pro-life movement? Christian extremism. And some of you might have seen this story. Just within the last few days, Hall of Fame football co coach Tony Dungy took a, a bold stance. Appreciate this guy's courage. And he tweeted on Wednesday that he would be attending the March for Life in Washington, which in fact he did. I saw a portion of his speech. And he said he was going to do so to support those unborn babies who don't have a voice. Well, that announcement sparked all kinds of criticism. Here's just one example. Dave Zirin, sports editor, editor for The Nation, said that he's done with Tony Dungy and the way the NFL and NBC coddle his right-wing extremism. We're the radicals. We're the extremists. But here's the question. Is being an extremist necessarily a bad thing? I like the response my good friend Mike Spencer gave in his book, Humanly Speaking. Mike says, no, we're not militants. Rather, we are a band of gentle warriors compelled by Christ's love and by the humility that characterizes those who have been forgiven a great debt to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, to bind up the wounds of the brokenhearted, and to rescue those being led away to death. Armed with the gospel of Jesus Christ and a sacrificial love for others, the church is the hope of the world. Christianity has proved a powerful force for good wherever the gospel has been exported, 
We establish hospitals, universities, soup kitchens, rescue missions, food banks, women's shelters, orphanages, and adoption agencies. We drill wells in Africa and Asia and rush to every catastrophe around the world to help. We advocate for those caught up in the jaws of, of sex trafficking, and we minister to those who are struggling with addictions. And contrary to popular belief, we adopt and foster children at a disproportionately higher rate than non-Christians. Barner reports that 5% of practicing Christians in the U.S. have adopted children, more than twice the number of all others who have, adop who have adopted. In addition, 3% of Christians, compared to only 2% of all U.S. adults, are foster parents. That's a stunning stat when one considers that the 2% includes all other religious backgrounds combined, Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, etc., the fact is, the foster care system in the U.S., as imperfect as it may be, would nonetheless collapse in on itself if not for the thousands of Christian families who have opened their hearts and homes to children in need. I'll ask again, is being an extremist necessarily a bad thing? The answer, of course, is dependent upon what you're being extreme about, right? When Dr. Martin Luther King was faced with the accusation of being an extremist, he replied this way in his letter from the Birmingham jail. He said, But though I was initially disappointed at being, as being categorized as an extremist, as I continued to think about the matter, and I gradually gained a measure of satisfaction from the label, was not Jesus an extremist for love when he said, love your enemies, bless them and curse you, do good to them that hate you and pray for them that despitefully use you and persecute you? Was not Amos an extremist for justice when he said, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream? Was not the Apostle Paul an extremist for the Christian gospel when he said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus? Was not Martin Luther He's talking about the church reformer there. Was not Martin Luther an extremist when he said, here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. And then, then he actually goes on to give a couple other examples, but he concludes this way. So the question is not whether we'll be an extremist, but what kind of an extremist will we be? Will we be extremists for hate or for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or the extension of justice? Perhaps the South, the nation, and the world are in dire need of creative extremists. I think he's right. And so if defending the idea that every preborn child has the right to be born is an extreme one, then I'd suggest that we, like Dr. King, accept that label. Maybe even embrace that label. If opposing a procedure so gruesome and barbaric is considered extreme, then extremists we should be. We need to agree with the sentiments of Dr. King. The world needs more creative extremists. And I, for one, would far rather be an extremist than an accomplice. And I hope that you'll join me. How about we stand for prayer? Tough truth today, God. Tough truth. And yet, important truth. And I pray that we can receive it that way today. Even though it makes us uncomfortable, even though we may have squirmed a little bit, whether physically or internally. These things that are realities that we need to deal with, God, is going on in our world. You are the giver of life. You created every person in this room today. And you created them to have a relationship with you. You love them. You, you don't even know their name. You know their fingerprint. You know the number of hairs on their heads. You know every specific detail about their lives. And you love us infinitely. 
And that alone, that fact alone, gives value to every human life. If we call ourselves your people, then we need to abide by your truth. We need to follow the example of Christ and walk in his footsteps. So help us to do that. Help us to be extreme about those things that matter the most to you. Even when we get pushed back, even when we encounter resistance, our goal, Lord, is not to be obnoxious. Our goal is is not to gloat. Our goal is, is not to intentionally be offensive. And yet there comes a point where we have to say, this is the truth and this is where I'm going to stand and that's the way it is. And so give us confidence, Lord, to do that in these days. Lord, uh, encourage us this morning to see that there's all kinds of possible ways for us to be Uh, standing up for life we can do so in our conversations with loved ones we can do so in in what we post on social media we can do so by attending a march a demonstration that that puts feet to our action we can reach into our our pocketbooks and get behind local agencies like helping hands pregnancy resource center in wells county that not only comes alongside hurting women but also helps broken families there are just countless ways we can pray. We, 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 we need to pray for this issue. We should be encouraged to pray. We just saw within the last few months dramatic results from the prayers of your people, 50 years of prayers that were answered when Roe was overturned. Thank you, God. Thank you for making that happen. And now as we continue to stay engaged, knowing that there's still more work to do, I pray that we'd be faithful. Pray that we would diligently seek out and search our place, our role in this fight. God, help us. We call ourselves a city on a hill because we want to shine, because we want to declare truth, because we want to make a difference. Taking a stand for life certainly does that. And so scatter us every direction, and I pray that even this week, You'd open up doors. You'd give us opportunities to put into practice what we've discussed here today. Thank you, Jesus. We pray it in your name, and everybody who agreed said, Amen. Amen. Have a great week. God bless.